Yes. Good morning, good morning, and thank you so much for coming by. We are, we, and I say we, we are all in for a treat as we listen to the art of three in conversation and song. And to welcome these three great legends, would you please welcome Mr. Kenny Barron, Mr. Ron Carter, Mr. Billy Cobb.
I shot with black because he just got a change and he would trust my sense of where does A and uh, or Russell. Uh, I think the other thing about guitar is such an individual sounding instrument. My job has always been trying to find the range of the guitar that allows all my notes to be heard. And West Montgomery had a certain sound, Grant Green had a sound. George had a certain sound, and my job was always been to find out what kind of sound did he have. And I haven't heard you play. My first recommendation to be is find a sound. I'm not saying to get history of the guitar. I mean, uh, George Mason invented the wheel, so don't worry about that part of it. Uh, what kind of sound do you want to be responsible for? What kind of sound when you open your guitar case, that sound just comes out. You know, each night I tell my students when I take my bass out of the case, I use the sound from last night's case. Hmm. And my job is to match that sound from last night. I've done that for at least 35 days. So my first recommendation to you, my advocate, is find your sound. The second thing I tell you is find that sound every night. If you find that sound, then you email me, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Another question here. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning. I've never been moved more than the tune you just played. I literally was moved. Thank you. I've never experienced that before. The question I have in this trio setting, as Billy was saying, that this is a conversation with each of the players. In, if someone just said, what it would be the most important couple of lines that you could give advice to a drummer coming and joining you on the dance? I know that's a real general question. What is the key? I mean, like, if there was like an order of you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. I don't even know if you think like that. I mean, this is I'm just grasping it. How do they that for coming from giants like yourselves? Kenny, start. You got my turn. <laughs> <laughs> so you mind repeating it for the West Coast? Okay. Briefly. Can you turn him up a little bit? It would be helpful. Yeah. Kenny, the question was, what advice would you give to a drummer? What do you expect from a drummer in a rhythm section setting like this here? What advice would you give to them? Um, first and foremost, I want a drummer who's going to make me sound good. Okay. You know, in other words, a drummer's going to make my stuff work, whatever that is. You know, uh, so I'm gonna listen for, for me, uh, well, take the example you just heard about, you know, can the drummer play with brushes, you know? Uh, is playing a ballad as important as, for this particular drummer, is playing a ballad as important as playing something fast? You know, for me, a ballad is something more than a space between two fast songs. You know, which is how a lot of young drummers think. Oh, this is, you know, this is a fast song. It's a ballad. Okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll get to the fast song. You know, uh, but it's, I can play ballads all night because yeah. because I, I love them. You know, and for me, a drummer has to be that sensitive. You know, to play with brushes and, and uh, uh, I once played with a drummer who played uh, very loud bass drum on one in the ballad. Drove me nuts. You know, so it's about less and more sometimes. You know, you don't, you don't want to hear that boom on the first beat of a ballad. You know. Uh, 
So it's about being sensitive, you know, being sensitive. I'm talking about playing the battle, being sensitive, you know. Less is more, you know. I, I could barely hear Billy. I knew I could feel him. I could feel him. But I couldn't hear all of them. But I could definitely feel him. So, so I think that's what you, you want to be able to feel uh, 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 the drama. Now on something uh, up tempo, swing, groove, all of that support. Simple beat for me is important. You know, uh, some things have to be worked out on the bandstand. You know, because yeah. when because you have to hook up with the bass player. You know, do you both play behind the beat, or do one of you play behind, one of you play ahead? Which can, so you have to kind of adjust as much as you can. You find out what's happening, and uh, you make whatever adjustments. Somebody should make some adjustments if it's necessary. You know, as otherwise it's going to be just push and pull, which is not a lot of fun. <laughs> so it's it's about listening. It's about uh, reacting to what you hear. You know, I hope I answered your question. I don't know that. Absolutely, yet. absolutely. Okay. Can you mention about the ride symbol, the importance of the ride symbol for you? Uh, the ride symbol for me is terribly important. For me, you know, that's, that's something I listen for. Uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, I remember playing with the drummer, uh, whose thing was that he did not use a set, a drum set at all. All he used was this ride symbol. He came, I was playing at a place called Bradley's in New York, and he came in, and, uh, the bass player said, oh, this is, you gotta hear this guy. All he used, all he used was some bright symbol, no sock symbol, no bass drum, nothing else, you know. And I did not miss the other drums. That's how important the symbol he was, you know. So that ride, that ride symbol was terribly important, you know. Ron, what would you say for a drummer? I like to think that he trusts my use of space and my very long nose that allows him not to feel he has to carry the weight of the burden of his own. That he understands the form of the song and he knows that this note to top of the song, if it's not a root, that's okay. Billy, play with authority. That doesn't mean you can play loud. Be secure in your in your convictions to play and be supportive. Uh, the objective at the end of the day, on the horizon, which you never will get to, but only be successful at getting closer to, is to consistently contribute musical thoughts or your thoughts transpose into music if you can. As a you know fan, big fan of the same man kind of thing to say, but when you play, don't be afraid to literally make a mistake based on the fact that you sincerely thought that that was the direction in which you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. You know. You're an idiot if you do it twice. <laughs> and, and fail. The objective is to do it with conviction. Doesn't mean you have to blow everybody away or play louder than or take on the, the mantle of being the elephant in the living room that's just blowing, moving all around, knocking everything over. It, just to make a point, it's about trying to blend in not trying, it's about blending in and enhancing what you hear in your own way. Some things will work and some things won't. Chances are you'll have a losing average all the time. Uh, the percentage is always down, but so did Ted Williams, you know, but yet he hit 401 at the end of his career. The whole objective is to kind of do things that make some sense. And eventually you find that uh, because you have that attitude in a way that is musically effective, you probably work a lot. You know? That's what this is all about. Fantastic. Next question over here. Hey, this question. Is that microphone on? There it is. It's not. 
Again? Okay, let's hold it right there. Uh, give your question here. I'll go back to that. Oh, Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, this question is for Mr. Carter. Uh, when you work with Miles Davis, um, did Miles ever write down any specific bass lines for you to play? And also, like the tune 81, is, was that your composition or Miles' composition? Uh, number one, Miles never gave me a bass line. If he had, I probably would not have played it. <laughs> And anyone is, in fact, my composition. Mine. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that bag of friends of mine, uh, we had almost no written instructions other than a lead sheet that I was going to hurry at home. And we were kind of on our own to come up with our own devices that would make those songs have a life. And during the course of the five year period or so, we would have a chance to build songs again and again and again to develop a bass line or to develop a rhythm pattern or to develop a sound for those individual songs. Uh, so we were kind of my, my example of that group of guys is that we would go to a laboratory every night and Miles was like the head chemist. He'd bring all these new elements every night, different elements. And our job would be to combine these elements into something that was worthwhile. Sometimes they were really great. Sometimes they were a whole lot less than great. But the fact that we could experiment every night made going to work that night a special event. And the results of those experiments are that bad. Beautiful. Over here. Good morning. Um, I noticed at the beginning of the live stream you played with the piano in the beginning, both Ron and Billy were almost in a meditative state. You were just eyes closed and very, you know. I was just curious what's actually going through your mind at that point in time. Are you, are you <laughs> counting? Are you singing the melody? Are you thinking about a part of the song that gives you trouble? Or, you know, what, what is actually going you know, through your mind? And, and Kenny, if, if the bass was to do that, what, what would be going through your mind? What I was doing was listening and interpreting what Kenny put in and how I could best enhance that thought musically, combine my feelings my, through the instru my instrument to, to make, help that make uh, a solid uh, platform for, which was for us to, to continue to play. Uh, it's very, very important to, to listen and translate, not just listen in one ear out the other. For instance, many times I'd ask you guys, I count off the piece, said, okay, ready, one, two, three, four, and then the tempo would come down to one, two, right from the very beginning, because no one was listening to me and translating what I asked you to do. It's a habit. It doesn't happen like that. You just have to be cognizant of it. Be aware that everything from the very, very first downbeat of any piece is as important as the very last note that's played in the piece. Throughout life, you know, be aware of everything that's happening and translate it so that you, it for that the idea is to, to, to transfer it into something that you feel you can enhance by what you bring to the table when you play. That's me. Okay. For, for me, I was uh, very upset that Kenny Bear would call this song. That I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> and I have four bars to find out what the song is, what key we're in, how many bars it is, and can I find a top of tune for the second chorus. And I'd like to thank Kenny for having faith in me that I would find it out before six bars went by. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you are a part of right now. 
there's a process of musicians who don't know a common song in this case. And our ability to make that knowledge available to us by the time the second course rolls around so that I know the title, I know the form, I know the changes, Billy trusts my downbeat so that I can outline the form for him if he does not know this song. And Kenny Barron is not afraid to do what he does because he knows that I know this song. And I'm less angry than I was before. <laughs> Call the day in the lodge. <laughs> After doing that. <laughs> Let's try another question back there under the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a question. Um, but first, I, I, I just want to uh, express what a uh, privilege and honor it is to be here, standing here today in the presence of such greatness. Um, that's, uh, I hope everyone appreciates it as much as I do. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going off track on um, this. is not a performance question so much as it's for Ron Carter. And uh, the question is about the piccolo bass. First time I ever heard one or heard one play was by you. And I can't recall if it was on the uh, you know, Uptown Conversations or, or uh, Alt Blues or um, the first time I heard it. But um, I was wondering. Is that a concept you came up with, or did you discover it somewhere else? And what tuning do you use on um, I'm in the position of all bass players out there. Now. Are bass players here? How many of you are bass players? You know, all you guys want to be bad leaders at some point. You've had a lot of taking requests from the drummer and demands from the piano player. At some point, you want to be the guy who makes those same decisions. And I got to the base in my life in 1975 or so, before you were supposed to, you were born. Uh, and I decided that in order for me to be the band leader, I wanted to physically appear to be the band leader. And to do that, I wanted to sit in front of the band. When you walk into a room that's a tree or so, whoever's in front is, is, is not only the band leader, even though the bass player may be his band. So I decided to make me have something to sit in front of the band with. So I found an instrument maker in New Jersey who was amenable to experience. And I spoke to him one day and said, I want a, a, an instrument that does A, B, C, D, and E, F. And we decided that each body the right size and the measurements and uh, I would tune it top string C, G, D, and A. I could show up to me upside down. The bass was approximately uh, between the half size and a three quarter size physical instrument. Has some special strings made. And, and uh, because it was between a cello range and a bass range, I wanted to be specifically known as something other than a small upright. So I said, well, how about calling it a piccolo bass? Now, there are several guys who now use that name for electric bass as smaller or as a six string electric bass. Or it's, it's kind of a common name now, as it was to three years ago. But I don't claim ownership of the name mm -hmm. you know, or invention of the instrument. I, I, if I have a claim that's a guy, it's something that's it's been from the band, so I'm talking about Dr. Ross. That's important to be physically the boss. Mm -hmm. Basically, as you understand that, you always know, back behind the trees. Last count of bandstand, all that kind of stuff. I want to be the first count of bandstand. So I'm sitting in front of this instrument called the Piccolo Bass, and I only use it with my group. I don't jam with it. I don't play with the college band with it. I don't play with my band with it, because I want that only to be seen at my environment. Make it really special. And uh, so far, I'm pretty good at that. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so um, I just want to start off by uh, saying that, like you know, I'm a huge fan, and I've been listening to your music for a long time. And is that Billy Cobb? Yeah, um, <laughs> really all three of you guys, and um, um, like just kind of like noticing, like um, like um, sorry, I'm, I just lost my train of thought. Um, like, sorry, I'm sorry, Oregon. Yeah, I'm just gonna go straight to the question. Um, what's kind of your um, 
opinion on like the evolution of music, considering that you know, like when you play, like you know, you brought so much like you know, great music to America. What's kind of your opinion on like the evolution of music and how it's like you know changed so much? So, where is jazz going? The, 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 I think the public fine tuning. Yeah. Where, where is jazz going from where it came from to where it is now? Yeah, that's kind of. Down the tube if you're not careful. <laughs> Reason I say that is if you haven't noticed, the two pieces that we played, I, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you were not familiar with those pieces, okay? Especially at your age. Okay. We were talking in the in the room there where the jam sessions are. I I walked in on a conversation with Ron and Kenny about what you guys are jamming to, the tunes on the board. But most of the tunes fundamentally one chord change. Okay? If you think about it, everybody just says, and that's it. If you go to a, a jazz festival, you'll get jazz artists that you would never believe were jazz artists because all they can do is play to one chord. Um, and it's fundamentally in the same <coughs> idiom all the time. With all due respect, Rihanna is not a jazz artist, but she sells a lot of tickets, okay? So, and it's a jazz festival, they have to keep it going. That can only go for so long. Eventually, Rihanna might stay or disappear, and the festival may not have enough money to, to be supported, to get to be supported. Where 20 years ago, thereabouts, and I hope I'm wrong, maybe even as little as but 10 years ago, I doubt it though. Uh, because I'm thinking about the Moultrie Jazz Festival in, in, in one of the 10 biggest festivals in the summer. There used to be Jazz musicians who are no longer with us, unfortunately. Oscar Peterson, Kai Basie, the list goes on for a long time. Uh, who played in the idiom, and they never played on one, they rarely ever played a two, one chord change. Okay. Every song had a story, and not just their story, but the origins of, of the piece was based on something that happened to the writer or thought, who thought in a certain way. That does not happen now very often. What we're jamming to is a challenge for us now, which it should not be. And, and as I, I, I feel, what we do up here, we've done just in two tunes, just to give you a great contrast, should be played throughout this country. The, where the format was developed. And most of this country does not hear this kind of stuff. With us playing, you know, we they are with all the respect for those who may play it, watered down versions of what's happening because they haven't lived it. And it's important. Every note that we play, there's a story behind it, you know, for each of us personally. And that's how I look at playing the music. It's not just about the core change on the paper and what the book says. It's about, sometimes I, I remember this tune and I, and I realize I remember, I remember Eddie Thompson or I remember Jackie Byer or somebody like that. Uh, Billy Taylor, of course. Um, uh, just playing this tune, tune in, in a club with maybe five people in it. Uh, and most of them are eating and you're hearing glasses tinkling and all of that kind of stuff, but it's, it's a job. And this is what we have, and this is where we work, and this is what it's all about. Six nights a week, possibly with a matinee on Sunday, you know, with a whole lot of shows. And it, this is what I, I go back and go, wow, I was blessed to be able to do that uh, and hold my craft, you know, Come hell or high water, you know, be there on time or lose the game. 
This is a long line of people waiting to work. That all of this comes to mind, and it's in every note I play. Uh, we don't have that now, see? And all I can recommend is to have more sessions like this, if at all possible, while we're here, obviously, uh, and, and where it, there's some meaning to it, and of course, along with us being here physically, to listen to what we have done and our predecessors have done, to get a good idea of, of what, what should be done by those in the future. Lana, what do you say? <laughs> Kenny, I'm more here than you. <laughs> Kenny, what do you say? I can only uh, concur with uh, what Mr. Tom said. Uh, it's kind of sad to go to uh, they have a lot of jazz festivals, for instance, in the Caribbean now. There's not one jazz artist. Not one. You know? Um, and that doesn't portend well for the music. You know? So it's up to you. You know, it's really up to you, you know, to really learn about the music, to learn about the, the history of the music, so that you can carry it forward. And it's a big responsibility. Because yeah, unfortunately, like in my age, I'm, I'm, I just turned 17 uh, about like a week ago. You're 17? Yeah, I just yeah. turned 17 like a week ago. And, uh, happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say happy birthday, please. <laughs> okay, happy birthday. Just, uh, like classic rock and like you know I liked what was before that so I never really got to like you know enjoy it while it was like you know like a huge thing unfortunately so fantastic so great question man great question you got the responsibility to do exactly what Kenny said go out there learn jazz play jazz and share it okay. listen 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 next That's question awesome. thank you very much thank you You're welcome all right uh, once again, thank you guys so much for coming here today and sharing this music with us. I know everybody in this room really appreciates it deeply. Um, this question is for Ron. Um, as somebody who has previously recorded on electric bass and upright bass, uh, maybe like for a specific example, like Red Clay, the original album, um, I was wondering, when you're playing electric bass, do you view it from the same perspective as the upright bass, or do you think of it as like a different vehicle, a different voice? Um, do you approach it with your playing in a different way than you would if you were playing upright? Um, you know, there are so many similarities that they get in the way of the differences. <laughs> uh, in that they're the same strings, uh, the notes are in the same relationship apart from each other the same chords, you know, nothing new under the sun. What has happened since those days is the bass players of the electric bass have taken the instrument to a different place in music. And uh, one of the things I find a little uh, concerning to me for electric bass players is that they're, they're kind of locked into a specific area of their music. And this area doesn't make them have to learn how to play changes because the songs they play are basically a baseline, and that's, I admire the ability to, to do that. I'm not sure I can do that all night, play the same James Brown baseline, no matter how good the groove is, or a parliament band, you know. And, and again, I say this not to denigrate any of those guys. I would like to see them get involved in playing changes. That would open the base up more for them rather than playing here all night or eight, on, on eight strings, you know. One of the reasons I discontinued playing electric bass, I knew they would take more time than I had to be as fluent as I was trying to be in a place where certain electric bass players already were. And I thought it'd be more productive for me to find out more avenues to make this work for me. And I'm finding more avenues all the time, like a half hour ago, I mean, I doubt that I would have played that order of notes in New York at the same time. You know, that
curiosity. I decided that I'd rather invest in curiosity in this, 100%, than 8% of this and 20% that, you know? And I've learned, I've, I've, as I've known more and more electric bass players, we have so much in common, despite our different functions. You know, their function seems to be to hold the groove, whatever that is, you know? And our function is to make these guys play different every night. That's really my job. You know, and I enjoy what they do. I watch them, I listen to them, you know, I attend their gigs, you know, and they come by to see what I'm trying to do and the relationship is uh, a good thing, you know. Uh, I just wish they would come to my gigs more often. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. Let's do another question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your beautiful music. It was a, a sheer